So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we're going to talk about self-publishing and perishing, which is a um, really interesting uh, area that I have a personal interest and investment in it. And um, really, what I'm hoping to do is give a little bit of background of why uh, libraries and librarians should care about it, and then go into sort of some show and tell mode um, and talk and anywhere within there. Questions, comments, thoughts, things you want to push, bring them on. Can I get a quick show, uh, library type? Do we have public? Are they academic? Special? Community college? Other? School? Others? All right, very good. All right, so some of this may or may not be relevant, but I want to give the background because if you don't know the phrase publish or perish, it's because you're not from an academic library because this is the academic world we live in. And just as a quick background, in case you ever do get a job there, uh, this was a report put out by the Modern Language Association that talked about over 62% of all departments report that publication has increased in importance in tenure decisions over the past 10 years. The percentage of departments ranking scholarship primary reports over teaching, interesting, has more than doubled since the last comparable survey conducted in 1968, so 75.7%. So publishing in the academic world is still a huge way that we show, frankly, worth and impact. This is another study, um, as suggested by the main title, publication expectations are significantly part of promotion tenure process for faculty members. Once the exclusive purview of doctoral granting universities Research expectations, including publishing, is now common for a range of colleges and universities. So it used to be that, yeah, you'd get a doctoral grant in university, you had to publish, it came out lovely. Now you're a community college, people are worried about publishing and such. And it really is sort of skewing. So there's been a really interesting push, on one hand, in self-publishing from the academic game. So in the academic world, one of the big factors that's pushing to self-publishing is the death of the uh, university press. It used to be that just about every major university had its own press, and they picked topical areas, primarily in the humanities, history, philosophy, religion, and such. And they would publish books on a regular basis, and so it was built into tenure decisions. Really, we've seen a collapse of that model where academic presses have just either gone away been subsumed under libraries, so suddenly libraries and academic libraries are in the press business, and they didn't ever sort of thought of themselves that way. There have been a really a couple of huge ones. Oxford University Press is actually larger than every other university press combined. Wow. Um, MIT still has a press, et cetera. But it's really sort of changed the dynamic in the academic world of publishing. And so um, things are getting interesting. But the idea that has emerged over the past five years is, is this idea of library as publisher. And so it's a, it's a theme that many of us have talked about, and we tend to mean different things. One is the idea of just a sort of what Eli talked about, where you sort of capture community expertise and capture community functions and broadcast that world. So you can, you know, he gave the example of the musician who was taking out instruments and publishing his own album that sort of fits in that larger milieu of, of libraries publisher. In some academic circles, this is really specific, where you know they're thinking about a press and imprints. And so, for example, in the public, uh, Provincetown Public Press, the Provincetown Public Library, has a press. It has an imprint. It sells things under its title, it gives it ISBNs, and markets them, and is really a publisher. Uh, Academy Park Press, DC Libraries, has a digital commons where there is a press. Does anyone know what that is? It's an espresso machine, actually, espresso machine. An espresso machine does not actually make coffee, um, but what it is, it's, it's a built-in press. And so on one hand, and Toronto Public Library has one of these. On one end, you have pretty much a, a high-capacity laser jet printer that prints, prints all your pages on eight and a half by 11 pieces. On the other hand, you have a color printer that prints out a color cover. And in the middle is a binder. So it will take your book, it will chop it down to whatever size you want, 8 and a half, 11 down. It will glue bind them together and then put the color cover on it. And in about, depending on the length of the book, 15 minutes to an hour, pop out a book. 
production costs ranged from about $6 upwards to $20 per copy of the book. And so the Toronto Public Library, they have this so that people come and they're doing um, local histories and genealogies, their own novels, family guides, all sorts of things. You come in, they give you a brief tutorial on how it works, they help you format the document, they send you in the back, and in two hours you can walk away with the book in your hand. So there aren't too many of these. These are expensive. Um, they, they tend to be a bit finicky. You're dealing with glue inside a mechanical machine, so that doesn't always work out well. But by and large, people have tried this. DC has one of these. Um, so this was going to take over the world. But as you'll soon see, something got in the way of it taking over the world. Um, this is library publisher. This is um, Scott Walter. If you don't know Scott Walter, at DePaul, so another Illinois shout out. Um, and you see, we talked about academic presses and institutional repositories, but this is a quote from uh, the DePaul Library. Digital open access publishing is changing the way people create and disseminate scholarly works. Libraries house the expertise to help faculty, students, and academic departments get their content out into the world and make sure that it's findable by search engines both in the short term and long term. And I think we can certainly argue that public libraries have that capacity as well. And school libraries have that capacity as well. So, fine, fine, fine. This is a guide, and I'll make all these slides available. Um, this is a guide that was put together a library publishing directory uh, featuring 124 library publishers from around the world. So this is becoming more common than you might think. Not all of those are academic libraries. A lot of them are public libraries and special libraries. So. This is what we think of when we tend to think of publishing, right? The big press. And this is a really interesting world because a couple of things have happened. First it is, it's not that hard anymore. Technology has, as it does with everything, broken all the components and pieces and parts. And the other thing is that when we first formed presses and publishers, they used to be soup to nuts. Finding it, getting it, editing it, figuring it out, typesetting it, putting it on the press, printing it, shipping it, delivering it, marketing. And what we've seen in the publishing world, as we've seen everywhere else, is this disaggregation of what is a publisher. So for example, I published a book called The Atlas of New Librarianship, which is this 10 by 10 sort of coffee table book that was physically published in Singapore. Because that's where it was cheapest that they could produce it, and they shipped it over the United States. And so they, MIT Press, isn't much of a press anymore. They're just the publishing house and they outsource all the production side. But with that, a couple of historical trends have occurred. And don't worry, we're getting to the fun stuff, but let me just at least set up why we're going to talk about it. And this is, a, this is an example from 1900 to 2003 of the number of book titles published worldwide. And what you'll see is this interesting little thing happens right around 1955. And what happens is ink and paper get cheap, 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 cheap. And what happened with that is that publishers suddenly realized that where before you would publish five books a year and hope that two of them made you money to pay for everything else, suddenly for the same cost you could do 10 books or 20 books in a year and still only need two or three to make your budget. And so what they started doing was going wild and printing as much as they wanted. People got into the publishing business. Lots of people became presses. Lots of titles started going out. The other fork of this talk turns into libraries didn't change their collection development policies. But the bottom line is we've seen a real growth in what we consider traditional publishers and the gatekeepers. Now, at the same time, this is a growth of self-titled charts from 2002 to 2010. The blue are titles published by traditional publishers. The red are non-traditional publishers, read self-publishing, read individual vanity presses, read all these things that are getting ISBN numbers out there. This is an interesting trend. And you guys have already encountered it if you use Overdrive. Because Overdrive loves to tell you that they give you this massive access to wonderful published books. But if you spend any time looking at Overdrive's catalog, a huge and increasing percentage of those are self-published titles. So it's getting harder and harder to say, oh, we'll just get all the popular ones from HarperCollins because they may not provide it. But boy, there are all these other individual publishers. What do we pick? How do we pick it? So 
This is the trend that we're, we're going to start talking about. The other one, once again, is a little academic slide, is that we're seeing increasingly publishing moving to open access, and that is the idea that instead of traditional peer-reviewed journals, people are moving to open access where you publish them and they provide them on the web, they provide them online, free access to the sort of readers of it, and you can see that that's also taking off like crazy. So, there's my wonderful setting the stage. Let's get to the fun stuff. So what I want to talk to you about today, um, first we're going to start with some key decisions. Hopefully we can have a little conversation about that. And then I want to talk about tools. So we're going to talk about what it would be to get into the business. And the key decisions that you need to make before you even begin are these. And it starts at the top, which is publisher versus platform. So this is a really, really cool concept and a conversation that's going on right now on the web. And it's the idea that are you a publisher or are you a platform to publish? And what that turns into is really selection and curation versus tool provision. So there is a site, there is a site called Medium. And if you haven't seen Medium, Medium's pretty cool. So let me just take you a, a second to, to walk over to this site. Medium um, is a set of tools, think of it almost like blogging, but the intention is when you have something to say that's longer than a blog post and shorter than a book, where does it fit? It fits in this medium. And so you see a lot of interesting people using this to publish essays. It's, this is the new home of essays and the scholarly thought pieces and the op-ed pieces. And what's nice about this platform is when you go, you can publish, I, I put whole books onto this, but if you go and say, I've got a new story, you give it a title, you know, hi, you tell your story, blah, 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 and it does what you think it does, which is pretty simple. You can do some basic formatting, like you can make things bold, and you can put in images, and you can put in videos, and if you went to the WordPress site, you're going to look at this and go, yeah, right? But what's nice about Medium that you can't do in most WordPress sites is it allows annotations and community commenting. So what you can do is once you've published a piece, so for example, um, I put up this Expect More book I mentioned is all available in Medium. By the way, people yelled at me because they said a book is too big for Medium, but I did it anyway. And what's nice about it is you can go in and you can comment word by word, line by line, section by section, right? And so here we're talking about you know, how to put in bullets and et cetera. But this is kind of you know, Google Docs-ish, but in a very public way and geared around an essay. And so some of this is we've looked at book talks, we've looked at lectures, we've looked at classes where they are text-based. If we can get the text online, you can have asynchronous conversations going on and the threaded dialogues going around specifically line by line words. One of the things that I'm looking at, and others are, is to put drafts of books that are going to be available online here so that people can give you feedback going forward. But when Medium started, it was selective. Not anyone could go and post a story. You had to be, in essence, a selected author to get into Medium. They had to go through a review check. And so they were very much seen as a publisher, that part of their job was curation, part of their job was editorial control. Pressure, everything else pushed to them, and everyone else said, why and how are you picking it? Who are you picking it? I wish I could do this, and Dave wants to use it for a class, and you want to use it for, David Weinberger does stuff on here, et cetera. And so what they did is they sort of said, all right, anyone can use it. And in doing so, they moved from a publisher to a platform. And, and the real difference is a change in the value statement. In other words, is the value that you're providing an open set of tools or is it your editorial curation? Now the reason that this is really interesting and important and specifically about libraries is if you are going to talk about your library as a publisher or are you going to talk about your library as a platform for publishing? This is a decision you need to make early. So, give you one story. One story is the Free Library of Philadelphia looked to put online um, literary journals. Anyone ever read or play in the world of literary journals? You ever have to buy a literary journal? Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. It's like, you know, <laughs> they should come with armed guards every month to deliver them, right? 
right? And because they're really, really expensive. And so they were saying, but you know, we've got all these poets and authors and everyone in the community, and they want to, as the library, make them available. Now, many of us in the library world, if you've ever published, anyone have published a book? Okay. If it's a professional oriented book, good news, you're not gonna have too hard of a time finding a publisher. Really, they're, they're they, you know, from ALA publications and between ALA and PLA and ACRL, right, there are people looking to publish books in profession. So it's not that hard. If you look to publish fiction or anything in the mass market, good luck, right? You want to be the next, you know, J.K. Rowling, good luck. You need an agent and samples and expect 50 rejections and et cetera. And so Philadelphia Free Library said, we can do it. Why not? And particularly around these literary journals that they imagine the idea that you know, they've got authors in the field, they've got poets, and we'll provide, we'll provide the ability to publish it. And then they had to make a decision, which is, all right, everything? Really everything? Or just selective or whatever? And they came down on the idea that, you know, writers are used to being rejected. I don't think they want to be rejected by their public library. And so yeah. <laughs> they decided to more or less be in the platform business, and they said, we're going to take it all. And then we're going to provide tools so that people can go in and, in essence, create their own literary journals and literary magazines. They can be the curators for their outlet, but the library is not going to play that game. Others, like I say, academic presses, et cetera, for years and decades and centuries have made the other decision, which is their editorial control. That's important to them. So this is a decision that you need to make pretty early in the process. Are you, as a library, going to be the imprint? Are you going to simply provide a set of services, we'll get to in a second, to help people self-publish, or are you going to be the publisher? If you're going to be the publisher, are you all comers? Are you selective? How are you going to handle that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But an early decision to make. The other decisions that you're going to need to make are what services are you going to offer? Because Medium is just a platform. Throw it all up and good luck. Publishers tend to provide a series of value-added services. Now, if you've ever worked on a reference desk, you probably have had someone who wants you to come and check their grammar, right? They come up and it's like, you do please check this, and why do you do a citation on this, and whatever, and you're sitting there going, God, no. Right, there was a great Twitter scree of someone going, you know, just because I work on a reference desk does not mean I know where the semicolon goes. And so, <laughs> right? So, you know, are you going to, if you're going to say, we are going to help you be a self-publisher or we are going to be a publisher of your works for the community, does that mean that you're going to provide help in production? Which is easy. And I'm going to show you all the tools that are going to, you're going to need so that you can help people format and publish their great novel. But are you going to provide editing support? And there's a suite of editing support. We like to think of editing as sort of copy editing. Your comma's in the right place. Grammar doesn't make sense. There's also content editing. Boy, you don't need this chapter. Boy, this is resequenced wrong. There's also development editing. Do you have an idea that's worth publishing? How would you go? Is that too wide? Is that not? And so there's a whole suite of editing services that can be provided. And as an author who's both self-published and gone through authoring, those suites can be invaluable. Right? So when I self-publish it, I almost, you know, I get to drag students and go, does this make sense to you? But I've had brilliant editors who have sat with me and talked about you know, the outline. Does the outline make sense? What's the market? So do you want to play that game? Indexing, good old classic librarianship 101. Do you provide an index? Now, most fiction, you don't need an index, but most things can really use a good index. And the other thing about indexing is authors tend to be the worst indexers of their own work because we're too close to it. And so are you going to provide indexing support? Design. I got a great text, but I got no cover. And I'm going to show you some of the tools to make covers. But yeah, the tools to make covers. Yeah. Are you going to help them with formatting? Are you going to help them with page design? Are you going to help them with all of this? And lastly, are you going to help them with marketing? Because I can publish a book and I can self-publish it, but that doesn't mean anyone cares or they're going to know about it or hear about it. So are you going to connect this? One of the really fabulous opportunities with libraries, particularly public libraries is that if we got together on this, we could be an author's greatest dream in terms of getting things out to the public. Do, are we going to do author nights and speaker nights? There was a great library that what they did was they had author nights. They contacted every author in their community, 
and they said, all right, on Thursday, we're going to have an expo. They gave them desks, they gave them displays, they brought in food trucks, they made it like a gala opening, they opened after hours to do it. They really created this sort of event around it, which as for an author was a really impressive event. And so they weren't selecting who, and they weren't, it was sort of open to all, but they really made someone feel relatively special in terms of marketing. Now, as we'll see as we go through this, not everything needs a mass market, but thinking about marketing. So these are just some services, and what's nice about it is, you know, this is what Eli talked about with production librarians. This is classic librarianship 101. This, you got to decide whether you want to play this game or not, but let's face it, our profession is full of a lot of English majors itching to get back into it. This has become much, much easier. This, we don't know, but we have a great capability that we have not been utilizing. So, all right, Dave, that's fine. Show me, show me, show me, show me. All right, so the rest of the day, I'm just going to go through a bunch of potential tools. Yes, I'm sorry, please. I have a question since you're about ready to go over yeah. Can you speak to a little bit um, about when serving as a platform, the level of quality and how much that may or may not drop? So the question, I'm, Joe's asked me to repeat the report. So the question that you all heard was the notion of quality and how, you know, as a platform, how do we deal with quality? You know, Right, lower quality, perhaps maybe someone who isn't maybe trained in writing formally right. or anything like that. How to manage that so that it doesn't become this repository that no one wants to visit? Excellent question. How do you manage a, a realm of, of qualities and worrying about overloading on low end quality so that it becomes a repository that no one wants to visit? And the short answer is um, just like we've done these questions for a long time with our libraries where we've made these type of quality decisions could bring that in here. One method that many people use is they have the repository where it all goes in. And then they have another level where they're highlighting, spotlighting, journaling, etc. And so it becomes like librarians picks. Or what's really great is they ask the community members to come in and create that where they go through the repository and it becomes, you know, Dave's picks or etc. Um, slightly aside but a fun story. Uh, in Portland, in Portland, Oregon, they asked a bunch of teens, what do you want from your librarians? And the answer was, we want librarians to blog. And this was like a decade ago, and the librarians did that face. You know, like, <laughs> really? Teens want to read librarians' blogs? Really? Really? And what it turns out when they sort of went in and dug deeper, teens wanted to know who these people were because what they really wanted was readers' advisory. They wanted to know what to read. But they didn't want it like, this is a good book. Oh, you're an idiot. Right? This is a good <laughs> book. Oh, you're cool. This is, right? They wanted to know the person making the advice. And so the same thing can be said here, which is we make a repository where it all goes in. But do we have the Nancy Pearls of the world that go in and pick for our community what goes and what's not? Other ways to simply say, we have a press and we have a selection price process and maybe we offer workshops and we bring writers workshops in and we help people develop the, their skills on it. So, but, but I want to be really clear here, this is, goes back to my talk and, and Eli's talk about, we can pretend that we can be objective and non-biased, but when Eli put up that, what was it, bad no one wants, bad everyone wants, etc., he was making picks, right? And he was picking winners and losers. And we do it on a regular basis. What goes in that display? You know, it's Black History Month. Not every book by a black author or, you know, goes up front. We make this on a regular basis. The question is how comfortable are we as an organization and how much trust does the community have for us to make that decision? In school libraries, it becomes really, really interesting because what's good and what's bad, you actually have a mechanism called grading to determine some of that. And so you can highlight, use this as a way of highlighting and building. But we also know that the library can be a really important place to build self-confidence for those who may not fit in that model. And so how do we become a publisher within that? So there's no one good answer to it. My, my short answer to it is the old fashioned, we're unbiased. And really what that means is we pick reputable publishers. So we sort of offload that. That's gone. So it's right there at the front desk where we have to make the decisions. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. 
you're going to hear and already have heard about sort of standard web publishing, WordPress, and I mentioned Medium, Tumblr you may have run into, etc. So I'm, I'm going to sort of, that's clearly a form of self-publishing. People are looking at it. Joe James, who's running for ALA president and is at the University of Washington, his primary publishing scholarly activity is a podcast. His podcast on documents that change the world, if you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. Right? So he takes the Magna Carta and he talks about it as a document, but then he tells the history of it and the consequences of it. One of which he did was, um, oh, it was brilliant. It was on McCarthy's list of the communists in the federal government, and it's a list that never got published and may never have existed, but it changed the whole dialogue, and so he sort of talks about that. That's his publishing. And so we can get into, when we talk a little bit about audiobooks, we can talk about podcasting and such, but that's out there as well. So I'm going to start with print. And before we jump into this, we, we really need to sort of address this question. All right? And, and the reason we have to address this question is because um, what happened was that people looked as technology became cheaper to do print publishing and as ebooks began to emerge, there are lots of little experiments and little startups and little companies. And so there's Lulu, which isn't even on this list, but we could talk about Lulu. And I'm going to show you one called Smashwords and all this other stuff. And they started bubbling up. And then Amazon bought them all. Not Lulu, not Smashwords, but bought a lot of them. And so right now, the best tools and platforms for publishing are really Amazon-owned or created. That doesn't mean, even though you use those tools, you're somehow restricted for distribution. I'm going to show you all of that. But I just want to be really clear as I go here, this is going to start sounding a little bit like an Amazon ad, but that's because they're the ones that have really taken to these tools and they've really built them up. It doesn't mean you have to buy into their business model. It doesn't mean you have to buy into their marketing. But they, they are the big player here to work with. All right. So we're going to start with we got our book. And we want to make a physical book. And I'm going to introduce you to a site called CreateSpace. So this was one of those companies that started up before Amazon got around to it, but Amazon bought them afterwards. And so what CreateSpace does is it really is a great platform for all types of publishing. For example, we're going to spend time talking about their books, but you can also publish CDs and on-demand music. So if you're a musician and you're looking to produce CDs, they will produce a CD with a printed cover in a jewel box. With a, it'll look like a professional one. It'll even be shrimp-wrapped, and you can buy 50 of them, or they can put it on their store and sell them, or you can sell them through Amazon. So if you have an indie music scene and they're looking at how do I make CDs and they're tired of you know, putting it into the burner one at a time, this is a place where they can begin to produce them. Um, we also have uh, other things like, for example, film. And if you want to talk about video, I, we can. Um, but these folks will do DVDs on them. Same thing they did with the audio, but they'll do them with DVDs. And so if you made your documentary and you want to share them with the world, you can go and produce your DVD. And you can even put it on Amazon Instant Streaming so that people can stream wow. through Amazon rental services and even through their um, unlimited service. Um, so, lots of different stuff. We're going to start with our good old fashioned books. And so what we can do is we can publish a trade paperback. And by doing that, what you can do is you will get lots of, I, I gotta make this bigger. I'm sorry folks, I, this is too tiny and I'm going to fix that problem. So I'll just scroll more, but you'll be able to actually see something. Uh, okay. So, a couple of things that they have. Overview. You can do everything from, you can create a cover, and we'll show you that. You can build your own cover from scratch, we'll show you that. Or you can pay them and they'll design a cover for you. All right. so this is a common theme you're gonna see. Here's the tools, you do it yourself, you know, simple stuff, do it yourself, pay us. You'll see that not only is that there for the cover, but you'll see that for the interior artwork, do it yourself, professional layout, or custom interior, right? So you can pay us and we'll do it for you. Printing options, we'll get to in a second. Um, we'll get to, it. we'll do that. All right, so let's, let's actually do that. So if I want to go to a book, and I'm going to create a book. I'm going to log in here. Publish a 
trade paperback, create a book. Yes, Dave, I would like to create a book. Tell us what your project is. My great novel. Now, you could be doing this, or you could be doing demoing this, or they could be you doing it for a patron, what have you. So, what is it? Is it going to be an audio CD, a paperback, a DVD, or a video download? We're going to do a paperback. We're going to go ahead and do the guided setup. There is an expert setup. So we get started here, and the first thing it says is, tell me about your book. So welcome to Basic Cataloging 101. Who, is, who did it? Um, you, know, you can have multiple contributors. You can have illustrators, notes by, afterwards. So you're just doing pretty much basic metadata here. Is it part of a series? What language is it in? When is it being published, etc.? And as you move through, it's going to get to the point of, this is the first question. You can skip it, but I want to just, this is one of those questions that most people aren't going to know what the hell they're being asked for. We do know what they're being asked for. So an, ISS, an ISBN, if you care, right, it's a unique identifier. You need it to go and sell it, in essence, in stores. And we use it for acquisitions. We use it for cataloging. You have a choice. Either CreateSpace will give you one for free, in which case, when you pull up the ISBN record, the publisher will be CreateSpace. You can pay us, and we'll give you your own. You can bring in one, so if you have, you go to, I think it's, who, who provides these? Bowker. You can go and buy a suite of them, so you can have your own ISBN and still use it here. So those are all your choices. I will tell you, as a self-publisher, I have yet to find a problem with just using a free one. Because when you get the printed book, you can put who you say the publisher is. I, I say that. I did run into one. When I wanted to go sell the book in Toronto Public Library, they said, I don't know who CreateSpace is as a publisher, and I can't buy your book. So you have to provide it to us. So that was the bookstore, not the library. So we can skip it for now, but you can go ahead and figure this out. And then you get to the idea of, OK, let's talk about the interior of your book. So, is it black and white? Is it color? Obviously, money there. Do you want it on white paper or do you want it on cream paper? You're saying, Dave, these are really great, but what about the actual file? So the actual file is, what size book do you want? So you can have books that are 5 by 8s, 5 and a quarter by 8s, 5 and a quarter. Here are all the ones you can have, up to 8.5 by 11. You can make whatever you want. The reason you kind of want to pick this first is the file that you're going to upload to them, which is your book, which is your material, is going to be a Microsoft Word file. You can also do a PDF file. So if you have people working in Google Docs or something, you can give it a PDF file. But if you choose one of these, what's really nice is if, yes, I want a 5 by 8, you can download a blank template or a formatted template. And so you can just go ahead and open things up in Microsoft Word. And it will come pre-formatted with style guides, the right margins, the left right, all the sort of, let me tell you, when you publish, all the things that you hate doing, right? You've just written your great American novel, you've done your hard work, and you sit there for three hours figuring out is it a .7 gutter and left, right, download a template, done for you. You can cut and paste it then, you can start writing in this template, whatever you want to work. You can use many tools. Like I said, you can upload a PDF or a Word. Word's a really great tool. Um, the right you want to use PDF is if you are going to do something more than just sort of a standard text. If you're going to have columns, if you're going to do you know, inset images and really fancy formatting, you might want to take it to a page layout program like InDesign or what have you. But Word does a really great job. And this, I got the, the sort of pre-filled template just to show you some content in it. You could have started with an empty one that had all the formatting right, but without the text that you replace. So, just to show you this Expect More book that I self-published, this is what it looks like in Word. It's also a 5 by 8 piece. And so, it just I use their template and cut and paste. Table of contents comes from Words. Footnotes comes from Word. All of this is just done in Word. Tables, the whole bit. Any new word, it will deal with. So once you've gone through and picked it, you know, do you want a black and white interior? Sure. Do you want white? Sure. Do you want that size? Sure. Now you can upload your book file, or do you want to start paying us now? We're going to upload our book file. 
I'm going to go ahead and grab it. Um, wherever I put it. Publications. Watch me try and surf my own file structure. Set more final. And off it goes. And so it's going to upload it. It's going to do a little thinking about it. So it's going there and figuring out are the gutters right, are the margins right, etc. Hopefully this won't take too long. Questions at this point? I know this is really gripping and exciting stuff. So. Alright. Come on. <laughs> Should have done this before. So you choose your own device and you're basically saying you're your own publisher? Yes. If you're not the create space label, is it going to be your own? So you've got three choices. You've got um, really the create space label doesn't show up anywhere on the physical book. It shows up in the ISBN record. So when you go, I'll show you in Amazon, you'll see create space as the publisher. If you were going through our acquisition system, you'd see create space as the publisher. The actual physical item doesn't have it anywhere in it unless you choose to do it. Um, ah, so now it's going through a check. Um, you can, so that's the free option. The paid option is they still give you one for 10 bucks, but you can go in and change the record. And then obviously you could go and buy your own ISBNs and acquire them that way, which is not super cheap. Um, and as I say, I, I've yet to really find, oh good, we can jump ahead. Um, really find a reason not to do that with CreateSpace because you guys would be the reason to do that or not, right? Are, you know, when you do your acquisition process, are you looking at the publisher? Do you care? Don't you care? Um, by the way, Amazon Unlimited, the vast, vast, vast majority of the Amazon Unlimited, uh, their Netflix for books, are self-published books. Very few of the actual ones. So we're going to, while that's checking, we're going to jump ahead to the cover. So the cover, matte or glossy, very exciting. Do you want to build one online, which I'm going to show you? If you want to do a professional design cover, you pay them. Or use your own PDF, and therefore you go into something like Photoshop or whatever, and you're designing your own. Um, this is what I did, but that's because I'm an illustration geek and I enjoy doing that. Um, and you can download templates, that whole thing. But let me just show you the build your own. Launch the cover creator. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. Right. So what the cover creator is, is it's pretty much templates. And so you can go in and decide roughly what template you want. And the good news is you can make a really ugly cover. <laughs> um, but we'll choose, I'll show you, and we'll choose this cotton one to, to show you how you can hopefully avoid that. Go ahead and say, okay. And what it's going to do is drop you into a web-based system where you can go in and you can, it already grabbed the title for us, it already grabbed the author. Do you want to, for example, change the background image? So instead of using one of their, you know, use one of our images, and they just have a bunch of sort of pre-made ones that you can grab, like the ebook. Use this in hope, ducks. <laughs> and so it'll, instead of having the prairie in the back, it'll be ducks. But obviously, if you have any photography <laughs> skills, um, you have an image, you know, you're sitting, you took a picture, you, you drew it, you painted it, you scanned it, whatever, you can upload your own image. So this template can be made really to look like what you want to. If you have no skills and frankly no concern, you can just go with their templates and you're happy. So you can go in here and you can do things like you can change the, so we've got the background image. We can edit this text so you can go in and you know change the text, et cetera. And so you, once you go ahead and you're happy with this, you would hit submit cover. And this is where it's not 100% a platform because they will review the, the cover. So Amazon CreateSpace here will review the cover. And if they find objectionable materials or something they don't agree with or blatant copyright infringement, they'll reject the cover and you'll have to go back. So, but generally, and I'm not going to submit it just because I don't want to waste their time with, with this right now. But let's go back to, where was I? So once you do your cover, and just to give you a sense, once again, if you want to go to upload your own PDF cover, Usually that gives me an option. Oh, it's thinking. Stop thinking. There we go. You can go ahead and it will give you lots of interesting options that will tell you everything like you determine your page count 
for black and white and you multiply the page count by 0.002252, which tells you they in essence need to know how thick the spine is. And once you do that, it will create a template that you can then take that template, depending on how graphical and geeky, and then once again, the kind of services you want to offer as a library, you can go ahead, and I'm just going to bring that template up. And you can sit there and lay out the book. So all of those wonderful lines that are going everywhere are their guides. And if I hide for a moment this sort of background image, you'll begin to see that this is actually their template. Let me make that more visible. You can download a template where it says, given what you told us, here is where to put all your pictures. So this is clearly more than just a cut and paste kind of job. If you know the graphics and design it, you can do it. All right, once we're happy, happy with this whole process. Yes, yes. Once we're happy with this whole process, you can, you've uploaded a file, they check the file. By the way, here's the action required. It, it did finally look at our interior and it found six issues with the files. It found, and if you go and launch an internal review, you can actually bring up a digital version of what your book will look like. And you can see what issues it found. So for example, it found, um, you, cho you chose five by eight, but you gave us a six by nine, which is true. And so it caused all these errors, including the trim size is incorrect. And this text is gonna be in the wrong spot. It's gonna be between our margins. It's even going to get to the point of we found typos. Wow. Um, so insufficient gutter here. So a lot of this is formatting, but you will find that it actually will say, you know, it'll do a spell check on it and say, we found a spell check that doesn't work. And, you know, most of those are technical terms or, you know, woof and that kind of stuff. But it does all that checking for you. So you can get a sense of what your book's going to look like before you ever do it. Once you're happy with all of this, you can go ahead and you, you will sort of submit it for final review. Once you submit it for review, they'll look at the cover, they'll check the issues. Once they're happy, you have to order a print proof. And so you have to pay like two to three bucks and they will, and then plus shipping, they'll send you and you have to review a print proof before you approve it for sale. Um, so, but what's interesting, back to the espresso machine, it's cheaper to do it this way than it is through an espresso machine. And it does more variety, better quality, all of this. This is why libraries aren't jumping on espresso machines, why no one's jumping on espresso machines, because this is a little bit longer, but you can get it. So let me show you then sort of how this turns out once you get things through. So I have published, so there's my great novel. This is their dashboard. This is the one we started. This is um, the two books that I've self-published. And what this dashboard shows you is, first of all, we can go in here in a second. Is it available for sale? How many of you sold in March? Weeha. Um, what your royalties are, you can order your own copies, and it even has what their internal ideas. And so if I bring up how this one was actually published, you, we can just sort of run through it now with a completed project. So here's the title information that I can change, but it's all filled out, happy, happy. Here's the ISBN, and I sort of picked one, so you're locked into it. Um, here was the interior that I uploaded, so it did it find processes, and we can bring it up. Here was the cover, and it was reviewed, and I can change it, which is interesting. You can change the interior at any time, and that doesn't mean you announce that there's a second edition. Right? So that's an interesting sort of slippery slope here. All right, um, and then you can set it up. Once you've done that, You've done a file review, you've proofed your book, then you can get in and you can begin the interesting questions. So once you've got a book where you're happy with the physicality of it, you begin saying, where do you want us to sell it? So they will put it on Amazon for free through CreateSpace. And I will tell you, having sold about 3,000 copies of the physical book, of those 3,000, 2,950 of them were probably sold through Amazon. So this is, you know, 
And one of the things is when you pick where you want it to go, it will say, do you want to exclusively put it in Amazon? Because if you exclusively put it in Amazon, we'll give you a higher royalty rate. And so you have to make a decision. Do you want to make it so that people can buy it through Barnes & Noble, people can whatever, or do you only want to sell on Amazon to make a higher royalty rate? Um, Create Space, they have their own store. Yeah, sorry. Yes, okay. absolutely. It's the, you'll get the higher royalty rate while that's in effect, and you can go in and say, now make it to the world. And even then, as we're going to show you with ebooks, they even talk about a six month window for that. So, um, yes, you can, which is very different than audiobooks. <coughs> we'll talk about this. What's nice about CreateSpace is you can make your own storefront, so you can go in and customize it. So you send someone a URL, it goes to just your page, which is nice. And then you can also do expanded, so it goes to bookstores and online retailers, so you can go to Barnes and Noble and find this. To libraries and academic institutions, so it goes to books in print, etc. cetera. Um, or once again, CreateSpace Direct is a wholesale unit so that independent booksellers can buy your book at wholesale. So you have all those options. You also have the ability to go in and say regions. For some reason, if you don't own the copyright in Lithuania, you cannot sell it in Lithuania. Right, so you can do really selective on that. Pricing, you have complete control over pricing mostly. I say complete, that's, that's an overstatement. So you can pick how much you want to sell it for. It says you've got to charge at least $10.92 for this because if you don't, all of your retailers won't make their money back. So they set a minimum pricing based literally on the page count that you have, but you can go in and then it says, given that price, this is what you'll make if it sells in different channels. So if people ask me for my book, what URL do I send them to buy my book? <laughs> <laughs> because Amazon takes a cut, these folks take a cut, and it will automatically set all this pricing. But I can go in and I can go and calculate, well, what if I did this for $100 because everyone really wants this book? So you can go in and play this game. Um, I'll tell you, when I first put out Expect More, I put it out for $15, I think. And I sold the ebook for $15. And I got a real pushback from the library community going, it's an ebook. It's at most should be $9. And so I went to differentiated pricing based on that. Um, this is all cover finish, etc. And the last step is you can go and say, I'm happy with that. Are you sure you want to leave before saying yes I do? I do not want to change my book to $100. Uh, the last step is you can now turn it to an ebook, and that's where we're going to pick up in a second. So that was a quick rush through, but really what we're talking about to make a printed book is Microsoft Word skills and this website that can provide it. Lulu.com is another site not owned by Amazon. You can look at theirs as well. The problem is getting it into the Amazon book market. If you're looking for wide scale, mass sales, Amazon. Lives. Just to give you a sense of the behind the scenes, well, one other thing I should say. Um, this is a quick sense of this went up for sale in 2012, and so currently I stopped tracking it in November. But to give you a sense, Create Space has sold 1,938 items. That actually means physical book sales. So that includes Amazon. Um, you know, Great Britain didn't buy too many of them. Uh, Smashwords, I'm going to show you for the ebook version, 50 of them, different venues. But really, Amazon owns sales here. I did break it down in 1.5, the different sale charts. Other thing that you need to know about is if you go, this is the physical production side, but the part that will screw you up is the sales side. So if you're going to sell it, that means you're taking in revenue. And if you're taking in revenue, that means you have to deal with sales tax and sales revenue. What is lovely, 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 lovely about most self-publishing options is they actually handle it for you. The book market is built on an agency model, meaning that you really are getting the royalties, not the actual sales. That's why there are different royalties for different things. So what CreateSpace will do for you is when you go and set up your service, um, return to dashboard. What it's doing is it's saying, for example, March royalties, 
here's your 19 books. You can get details and it will go in and say, of the 19 books, one of them was to Great Britain, all of these were through Amazon, what your revenue is, etc. They skip a month, so they're two months behind, but all the, your royalties get direct deposited into a bank account. They need a routing number and a bank. And it's all post-tax. They handle all the tax. And at the end of the year, they send you, in essence, a royalty statement, I think it's a 1099, which says, here's how much money you've made to put on your income tax. But you don't do sales tax. You don't have to become a depositor of quarterly filings and all of that. All of that is handled through this create space. And I'll tell you, when I first did expect more, I was assuming that I was going to be in the basement with my wife and we were going to be sitting packing boxes and shipping them out. I bought Square so I could take credit cards. I was going to do it all. I sold two books that way. The rest have all been through this online site because it's just like if I've gone to a conference and they said, we want to give everyone a copy of your book, I can go in here and it costs me two bucks to order a book. I can order 20 books at my cost, ship them off to them, and or send them to Amazon and they can buy it right from Amazon, I get the money, etc. So you can build a discount codes. Yeah. Yes, and what, because what it is, is you're paying your income tax on royalties. You're not paying sales tax on the item. But even to get more fun, let's say you order 20 books just to have around and hand out to friends. That's inventory that you have to claim as an asset on your taxes. Um, so there are tax consequences, but ha having them be the marketplace takes a huge amount of the whole sales and shipping and all of that goes away. So what I can do, for example, is uh, last year, so the other book that I've done, by the way, this is my, this is my great one. So at the Atlas of New Librarianship has sold about 4,000 copies, and I've made about, depending on how you count, eight to $9,000 in, in royalties, because it went through MIT Press, and so it's the standard, whatever they send me. Expect more sold half as much and made $20,000. It becomes a really, you know. Now, could anyone publish a book like that? I clearly had some notoriety in the area so that I could do my own marketing on it, but that's the kind of differences you can see. This was not the true when I published my other great book, The Boring Patient, about my trip through cancer, where I sold a total of about 120 copies, and I think most of those to my mother. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee because you don't have a publisher out there pushing it, that's on a catalog, you're the only one doing it, etc. So, and what I found though, so my quick little story, is, so I published the book, I was hoping to get lots of people to buy it, they didn't, it's fine, don't feel guilty. Um, and I went to the, the ward where I did the transplant and cancer treatments. And it turns out the nurses had found the book and ordered for them were starting to hand it to doctors and patients. And then they had me sit down with some patients and talk about it. I, and they said, just, so I shipped them like 20 copies and I don't care if I sell another one, right? So, so just because I don't make revenue doesn't mean that I'm not, this isn't a great vehicle for doing other things. You know, the family album, the reports, right? How many reports have we gotten from projects that are, Eight and a half by eleven Xerox sheets with two pieces of the construction paper and a tape binding, right? And it looks like you know a report for actually less money than xerography. You can produce something which is color bound, you know, glossy cover. It looks like as if it was published. I mean, the beautiful books the State Library did that we just got—they're gorgeous. But you can get that kind of quality through here now and do ten. And so, and you're still pretty cost effective. Now that was color interior, so not quite, but for black and white stuff, this is, this is the way to go. Other questions? If I can make this more interesting, I would love the detail. Yeah. What's interesting for me is that the library I work at, there's a lot of um, urban fiction fans. Yeah. And this thing has totally changed that genre <laughs> because it's just exploded and because people can do their own thing and put it out. Um, and I, the issue we're having now is I get lots of people who come in looking for creative space stuff in physical copy because they don't want to do the Kindle book. Right. So that's what, but it's, 
been kind of amazing to me, this, the explosion of that genre of literature, and it's all due to this self-publishing stuff, because anybody can do it, and there isn't the gatekeeper saying, right, we don't like this, we're not going to make it. Fan fiction has done, is another genre. Fifty Shades of Grey started out this way. Um, Amazon's interesting because Amazon tracks self-published sales, and if you do bump a certain amount, they will contact you, and they have their own imprint, and they will say, can we now become your publisher? Um, for this, so yeah, um, CreateSpace has you know you can go order through CreateSpace and find those books, and you know I look at it as a platform, but what CreateSpace does want to be is is the publisher, and so if you go looking for books, forget, yeah, here are their new releases, and so you can go and they've got their own sort of Amazon-like store, and so you can see this. So yeah, this to me is a, is a game changer. Right, this is like the laser printer. You became for self desktop publishing. This is now anyone can become book publishers and such. So now that you're happy and you've got your book and you're selling it, what about Kindles? What about ebooks? You can then create an ebook version. I showed you the last step of set the publishing book is you can go submit and it will turn it into an Amazon ebook. I'm going to show you other tools to do that. So um, if you then go, what it does is it ships you to another Amazon site called Kindle Direct Publishing. And you can then go in here, sign in with your massive Amazon life. And here are the ebook versions. And when you create an ebook, you want to add a new title, it has a step by step process once again. Where you, and by the way, this is that question you asked before about can I get out of it? This is their exclusive offer, which you can read about, and it's literally a check mark at any time you can be in or withdraw from the Amazon exclusivity. But you enter a title, you enter a subtitle, you go through, and you know, here's my new book. Um, and doesn't have an edition. Once again, it's asking for a publisher. So you know, this is the one that I created. It doesn't exist other than in my mind and on my books. A description. If you want contributors, if it has an ISBN, so you can skip the physical book altogether, do you have rights to do it because either you own it or it's in the public domain? And who do you want, what categories? So you're doing some basic categorization because clearly this is about general business and economics. <laughs> um, but it's BizAct in case anyone's worried about. Um, are there age ranges? Are there grade ranges, etc.? I'm ready to release my book now, do pre orders. Upload a cover. This cover is much less rigorous because you don't have to worry about spines and all that kind of stuff. And once you get the book, you hit publish and you end up with your published book. So here is, they were going to pick on the boring patient this time. And so here's all the information I filled out. And once you upload your book, here's the cover. So it gives you cover guidelines. And you get, once again, it has a cover creator. You upload the text of your book. Once you upload the text of your book, it can show you the spell checking errors. You can then preview your book right online. So unlike where the physical book you need to order a physical copy, this actually shows you what the ebook will look like. And what's nice is up here you can actually pick the device. I'm sorry, it's scroll over here. What is it going to look like on a Kindle DX? What is it going to look like on an iPad? What is it? And it gives you a quick preview of that book. Quick. Note, ebooks take you back to about 1991 in terms of desktop publishing. No tables, they have to be saved as images because they can, it is in the universal accession. You know, you can have illustrations, but pretty much they're black and white. Um, so it's, it's much more restricted in formatting because it's meant to flow. So this is what you think it is, but I want to show you if you don't want that, if you want a really cool, pretty, awesome book for a textbook or whatever it is, and you don't worry about selling it on Amazon, you can sell it through an iBook. iBook is Apple's world. So, by the way, if you do an ebook through Kindle Direct Publishing, it will be available on BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon, and Apple's ebook store, and all iTunes, etc. This is, Apple came out with their iBook author. And iBook author is intended to make books pretty for the iPad, period. Done, enough said. And so what you can do with this is you can go and say, you know, this is my book, and this is me. And it's what you see is what you get. As you begin laying out, you know, what is chapter one? 
right? And you know what? Here we go. And as you lay it out, you can begin to do formats and sides, and you can make things bigger. You can include things like let me get rid of this. You can include things like a photo gallery, right? You can include a keynote presentation. You can. So this was my keynote from Tuesday. So I can just put the keynote right in here. And so if someone's reading on their iPad and I said, see my presentation, whatever, they can actually go and see the keynote presentation. You can, at the same time, yelling at me for something. Oh, it's working on it. No, oh, there's our hoarder. <laughs> our happy hoarder. And now, there's the presentation that you can play. Yeah. You mentioned that if you publish with Kindle, it will also be available Barnes & Noble, I can it go the other way? Uh, with iBooks, you're stuck in Apple World. Okay. Nook has Nook Press, and I think you're stuck in Barnes & Noble World. Okay. Um, so, so actually, the Kindle is the most expansive to get in multiple markets. Which is interesting, because they've been so yes. guarded at first. Yes, but as the author, they're giving you the option. They're, they're, perfect. they're, they're incenting you to be exclusive. That's what they're doing. Higher royalty rates, things of that nature. But they're not restricting it, because they still want the catalog. Yes, and so that's what I did for Expect More. I said, all right, here's the generic board. And what's nice about it is you can download it in um, you know, Kindle format or Apple format, etc. I'm going to show you another site in a second. And then I made a pretty one here. And it was like minimal pretty in the sense that it has a few color pictures. And I got someone emailed me going, I don't like this because you can't do things like reflow the text, make the text bigger or smaller. Right? Which is in a Kindle, you can make it really big or really small and it'll just reflow. This is what you see is what you get. And so they actually said, I bought it, but I don't want it. I just sent them the, the, the Kindle version that they could load on their own device and they were happy with it. So um, yeah, this is an exclusive. And, and you also then have, the, like I say, the ability to put in 3D ro rotating images and pop-up sliders and really cool, pretty stuff. So you can make a really good textbook. Kindle is trying to get into this game. So they put out something called a Kindle Academic Publishing. It's right now all it literally does is upload a PDF and put Amazon's digital rights management on top. <laughs> right? But they want it to eventually be more like this. So watch. Maybe, maybe not. Now, with ebooks, option number one, Kindle Direct Publishing comes right from your print if you want to do it. Option two, iBooks. Option three are is a really, really cool site called Smashwords. Smashwords was an early, early adopter of ebook self-publishing. And so they have a marketplace, but you can also then go in and create an account, upload a PDF file or a Word file, and it will make its own version. What's nice about Smashwords is you can say, I want it DRM free. I can set the price to be zero dollars. I can um, allow it to be distributed to anyone. Smashwords is actually now has some deals with libraries where you can go and include Smashword books for free automatically in your catalog. So this is the sort of kinder, gentler ebook world. It doesn't get you into the Amazon ecosystem. So if you're looking to get mass sales, this is probably not the, but you can do it both. You can publish it in Amazon and Smashwords and iBook, you can go crazy. What's also really fabulous about Smashwords is that once you pick a book, depending on the book you pick, Um, you can go ahead and allow people to download it. It will automatically do file conversions for EPUB, Mobi. Um, I don't even know what that one is. Uh, you can even have it downloaded in uh, PDF. You can have it in HTML. So it does all that format conversion. And as the author, you can pick which ones you give people. So frankly, what I did is started it in Smashwords, got the PDF file I liked, and then uploaded it to Kindle because it was in the right format. And I can download this, and so we gave away thumb drives with a book on it. Start here, puts in the right format, and hand out the thumb. Do you want the Amazon version? Here's this thumb drive. Do you want this? This version. Love this site. Um, it also does the same royalty storefront options, except it doesn't put it into a bank account, it puts it into a PayPal account. 
and then what you're in PayPal you can do with it as you please. But same tax reportings, filings, all of that, all occurs through here. You're still in the royalty model. Questions on the The last thing then that I want to talk about. Do we need to be at a keynote at 10? Keynote's at 10. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake, go. <laughs> Audiobooks, they're fun. I'm sorry, I was just a man. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> If you want to talk to me about doing audiobooks, we can talk about audiobooks. Um, look at something called ACX. Um, that's what I was going to show you anyway. What's great about ACX is if you don't want to record your own, it actually is a marketplace and you can find voice talent and you can hire voice talent to do it. You can hire producers to do it. You can do it all yourself. And once you produce your audiobook, you can sell it on Amazon. You can sell it wherever you want. You can download it to a CD, things of that nature really fun. So, um, I'm sorry it was a lot of me doing touches. <laughs> this is something that I really, I love personally, and so if you, as you guys move ahead and you want to play with this stuff personally, or you want to talk about your library, you just want to get together and say, there's like a group of us that just send email about it. Did this work? Did you try that? Please, let me know. However I can be a Cool. Alright.